I studied Latin American, uh, I did Latin American studies in literature and another master in cultural, uh, with orientation in cultural anthropology. And both my studies and, and also the work I did there in the Netherlands contributed to help to um, uh, reinforce my understanding, a better understanding on human behavior. And I worked, uh, I did field research in Peru on uh, the political violence. I worked in Guatemala. I worked in the Netherlands in the refugee sector and uh, also in the social cultural sector. And the threat of violence was always present. Digital Audio Health by Cymatrax. like to welcome to the show Elena Perella, the pioneering leader of the new human being. Welcome to the show, Elena. Hi, Rhonda. Thank you. Thank you for having me. My pleasure. All the way from Italy. So yes. Elena is my first guest that I have interviewed from Italy. So I'm very excited about this. Let the audience know a little bit about your background so they can get to know you better. Of course. I uh, was born in Italy uh, on the beautiful island of Sardinia and um, I was a very active and happy child uh, but things began to change when I turned 12. I began to suffer from a binge eating disorder and uh, in my family they thought that I was a kid who loved eating and that um, I was going to lose weight uh, when uh, growing uh, when I grew taller, but that didn't happen. I had a serious problem, and nobody in my family understood that. Okay. Yeah, when I when my father died, I was nineteen years old. Mm -hmm. I felt as if the 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 floor fell uh, from under my my mm -hmm. feet and. Um, I suddenly realized that something had been missing all along and that now it was too late to do something about it. You know, my father and I didn't have a relationship, a good relationship. When he died, I really didn't know anything about him, just like he didn't know anything about me. And so he left me behind with a void inside mm -hmm. and a lot of anger because I was, I was, uh, yeah, I was angry at him for not being present in my life. And uh, his death marked also a turning point in my life. When he died, I began to see things as they really are, which means that I clearly saw that I was a toxic product of my family. Mm -hmm. I understood that my problems were not my choice, you know, because I, we actually are not stupid to choose to hurt ourselves or to choose to hurt each other. Mm -hmm. And so there was something that made me develop eating disorders. I, I smoked also and uh, I was bullied at school. Mm. And I understood when I began to see things as they really are that uh, it was an inheritance from my family that I was manifesting. And that was also a kind of relief uh, because when I, uh, when I awoke, when I began to see things as they really are, I also decided to become aware of all the toxicity that I inherited from my family, from my parents, and liberate myself from it. And uh, so I began this, this inner journey of uh, personal development and, and evolution, actually. And while I manifested my, what I call my family's toxic emotional inheritance, I also eradicated the root cause. And my family, our family's toxic emotional inheritance is a toxic combination between uh, generational traumatic memories, 
ideas, emotions, unresolved childhood issues, convictions, beliefs, inclinations that are that our parents passed on to us and that they fuel with their unhealthy behavior. And all this manifests itself in the problems we, we encounter in our lives, most of our problems. And it is fueled or worsened by the, the damaging influence of the system that governs us and that manipulates our behaviors. And so I, after a, a year that my father died, I moved to the Netherlands because my mother uh, was unfortunately not able and capable of taking care of myself. Uh, contrary to my father, she was she had been present in my life, but in an in a very unhealthy way. She was very obsessive, controlling. I didn't have any freedom to be myself, and she became my worst um, enemy at one point. And so when my father died, I understood that she couldn't do, um, she couldn't create a, a relationship with me. And circumstances began to work in my favor and I got the chance to move abroad, to move to the Netherlands. And I saved my life. Mm. In the Netherlands, I continued my personal journey on evolution. And I, I studied and worked I studied Latin American, uh, I did Latin American studies in literature and another master in cultural, uh, with orientation in cultural anthropology. And both my studies and, and also the work I did there in the Netherlands contributed to help to um, uh, reinforce my understanding, a better understanding on human behavior. And I worked, uh, I did field research in Peru on uh, the political violence. I worked in Guatemala. I worked in the Netherlands in the refugee sector and uh, also in the social cultural sector. And the threat of violence was always present, also in the lives of the people I spoke to. And um, after 14 years that I lived in the Netherlands, I decided to come back to Sardinia because I felt that I had to continue there. And uh, I didn't know that there was another big challenge waiting for me. So I came back to Sardinia to continue my path, but also because I fell in love with a man from Sardinia. We knew each other since we were children. And uh, we fell in love with each other. And so it, we began a relationship. And Rhonda, there were so many red flags. I thought it was a dream, but... <laughs> As soon as we started our relationship, I began to see red flags. My intuition said, he is not for you. Mm -hmm. But I really didn't understand why he wasn't for me. Did you listen to that intuition? I, I heard my intuition. I couldn't follow it. Why? Because I was programmed by my family to be in that relationship. And this man happened to be a narcissist, psychopath, and sociopath. Oh. Yeah. And so it was too late when I, when I understood that. He already began to be very violent psychologically, verbally. Uh, but because I was awake and aware, I understood that it was coming from my family and from the toxicity that my parents made me grow up with. And so I, I dove in my inner world and began to eradicate uh, the causes of that relationship. I uh, didn't really love myself uh, fully as I thought. And so I worked also to, to learn how to, to, to love myself more and to eliminate everything that I had inherited that pulled that relationship, that man in my life. And it took me 10 and a half years to do that work it was very long yeah yes yeah i broke up uh, with him i think twice or three times but every time i made him come back not because i was stupid but because i wasn't finished with the inner work and when i eradicated the last toxic element it was he who left me he tried to come back but the door was closed yes. the door was closed yeah mm -hmm. 
And so this is, and this happened uh, in 2018, five years ago. Mm -hmm. And then I began to rebuild myself, to rebuild my life because he destroyed everything, everything, every area of my life. And uh, during that period, I also started my uh, practice. In the beginning, it was a life coaching practice. Uh, and then it evolved into what I today do, the new human being, a real evolutionary process. And so the new human being, can you describe that to the audience so that they know what that means? Yeah. The new human being is an individual who is completely free from familial damaging influences and emotionally detached from the system that governs us and that manipulates our behaviors. And uh, new human beings um, are the answer to the technocratic transhumanistic society that our society is uh, likely to become in the future. And uh, they uh, have an enhanced human potential. They control technology. They don't want to become hybrids because, you know, now there is this narrative that um, we humans um, will, uh, I can say, uh, will invite technology more and more in our lives and that perhaps at one point we will become half machines. I really do not agree with that. I prefer to be human, to stay human, and to uncover potentialities that are silent in us because we really don't know much about us as humans and about our potential. But I know because I went through the evolutionary process myself that we can do much more than we do now and we can be much more than we are right now. And technology is not the answer, it's not the only answer. Hmm? And new human beings, uh, by not accepting that to become hybrids, will uh, preserve their humanity, their fundamental humanity, and so preserve our species. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, there's a lot of talk right now about AI and yeah. how rampant technology moved forward just in artificial intelligence. And a lot of people have a lot of different views on that. But our world is moving at a very fast pace. It is going in leaps and bounds in technology. It is scaring some people. And, you know, there's a really good part of artificial intelligence, and then there's this scary part. And But as far as being half human, half machine, I'm not quite sure about that. I haven't heard anything about that. So it's very interesting. I mean, we can take this a lot of different ways. What is your view about the intelligence of yourself and remembering and doing all this work to remember back to who you truly are? And now you are living your life, eradicating all of what you went through so that you can be in the true essence of who you really are. Can you speak about that? Yes. And uh, if you don't mind, I would like to say something about technology that yes, I am, not against. I am yes. not against technology. I mean, we are here thanks to technology. So that's oh, yes. great. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, We're... and technology can be very helpful if we use it for our health, for example, to identify uh, on early stage um, illnesses uh, and, and cure other illnesses that might be difficult to cure in the traditional ways. Uh, the thing is that uh, when it is uh, when it goes beyond that, then it can be very dangerous. And mm -hmm. uh, they have done already a first implant on a human brain at the end of January at Neuralink. Uh, the startup of Elon Musk, you know, and it is great if they want to help people who have motoric problems, uh, paraplegics, for example, that they can gain the control over their bodies. Fantastic. But are we really sure that they, that it, it will end there, that they won't go further and try to push it on 
the entire humanity, I wouldn't like to live with a microchip in my brain, for example, because then you lose completely control. They say that you will have control over yourself, but what if someone hacks your brain? Because this can happen, like they hacks computers. Uh, what if those microchips are all connected to a central system that will eventually control us all? I mean, we are already under control. What if they are looking for a more efficient way to control us and to make us behave like they want? Because they think that with technology, we solve, they solve our problems, environmental problems, climate change, social problems. I mean, there is there are big risks um, that uh, AI takes brings with it. So it's uh, and I believe I know that we can solve all those problems without renouncing our humanity. Yeah. You know, yeah, by evolving into a new kind of human mm-hmm. who has the control on technology, we can do that. We can do that. Yeah, yeah. and. Coming back to your question about my my living in my essence, I did indeed this process of evolution and eliminated all the influences, uh, negative influences from my family. I detached from the system emotionally. And uh, yes, I enhanced my potential and I am continuing exploring that pos- new possibility within myself on how I can be better better for myself, better better for others in order to guide them to reach also this point of being a completely new human, free from all those negative influences that make us uh, behave in ways that are not functional, that are destructive, so that we stop also hurting our children and passing our children this inheritance. Mm -hmm. So when you said that you had an intuition that you should not marry that person and you went ahead anyway, I mean, there's a lot of us that have have ignored our intuition, too busy, and we just say that we'll think about that later or do that later. And then we find out, you know, later got us in a whole lot of trouble because we didn't listen to our true essence. And so in your journey, after you left your husband for the last time, we we weren't married, fortunately. Oh, you weren't, (laughs) you were together. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. I assumed when you and your boyfriend Mm -hmm. left each other for good, did you then start, were you free up enough that you were able to start listening to your intuition and listening to those signs and signals about where your journey was leading? I was certainly free, certainly from the toxicity from my family that didn't allow me to follow my intuition. Unfortunately, he traumatized traumatized me very deeply. So after I freed myself from the, the, the familial damaging influence, I had to heal myself from the trauma of domestic violence. And so that pain sometimes prevented me from listening to my intuition. I knew that because it works like this, you know, it's not that uh, we hear, we listen, we hear the intuition, we have those feelings, but we, we do not follow it. It is that we can't follow it because uh, the pain of a trauma is stronger is very strong. We have no control on that. This is why we continue to hurt ourselves and others because we don't have it under control. And if we try to control it, we repress it. You know, the thing is that we we have to heal and to eliminate the toxicity in order for uh, us to be able to listen to our intuition and follow it. Yeah. And so I had to do... uh, a few years of healing work to heal the the trauma of domestic violence and being very aware of uh, was it my intuition? Was it the pain of the trauma that is making me do this choice? What is it actually? And then the more I healed from that and the more room my intuition had to, uh, to expand. And so I 
could follow it because I didn't have that wound anymore. Mm, very good point. Yes, it's very confusing where the messages are coming from, the brain or outside of ourselves to help guide and direct us. Uh, that is very, very interesting because yes, we can make wrong decisions because where our headset is and uh, the wounds that are that we haven't healed in our body. And so that's a really good teaching that you've given our audience that we have to really even maybe even go to a meditation and take our question to a meditation to see if we can become more clear. When you talk about the new human, do you have any instructions for people to that, you know, might be in a bad situation right now and how to help them move forward in some of the easier steps or the first steps that you took in order to free yourself from domestic violence is there anything that you can help the audience with any planning that you did or did you just leave and not come back for a long time and then went back like how did you end up doing that what I did was for me very important is that I didn't that I looked at myself you know I, I was of course, angry at him, and I blamed him for what he was doing. But I also looked in myself and said, okay, what is, what do I have inside that is pulling this man in my life over and over again? And why do I, do I attract him? Why did I attract him in the first way? And because we tend to, to, to blame the other, which is, normal and natural but this is not the solution to domestic violence uh, if someone like that comes to us it means that there is something inside of us that attracted him or her mm -hmm. and if we can be with this then we can start also um, identifying the elements that uh, are causing that relationship and at the very how can i say the 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 first thing that a person experiences domestic violence is a lack of love if you don't love yourself how can you want to attract a man or a woman who loves you mm. and sometimes if you do attract uh, someone who loves you you reject them because your programming tells you that you have to reject some all things that do not feel familiar. And so if we understand this, we can maybe reflect on it and uh, search in ourselves mm -hmm. what we have inherited, what my parents, our parents passed on to us. How, in which way is the system influencing me? Because there is the narrative from the system that the woman is the victim and the man the perpetrator. Is this really true? Mm, are men perpetrators and women victims? I mean, there are lots of women who are violent. And we don't have to forget that a violent man was once a child of a mother who had no love in her heart. What I say is it's quite strong, mm -hmm. but it is. Men who uh, do not respect women is because they want to punish their mothers. And so if we understand also this concept, which is crucial to understand domestic violence, we can really eradicate it from our world, mm -hmm. from our lives, from the world. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that people have a conscious awareness that they are rejecting a person who's loving towards them and accepting somebody who to them may feel like they're a challenge, right? Mm -hmm. And or they are attracted to and we don't realize we're attracted to what, as you said, is familiar, not realizing that familiar is taking us back to what we didn't want and tried to get away from. And is that why this cycle continues? This cycle continues because we don't 
because we are not awake. We do not awake. We don't see things as they really are. Mm -hmm. And we we let it happen. Mm -hmm. we so let let's it happen. talk about, we, yeah. So let's talk about that. We're not awake. And so how would we know that we are awake to these challenges that are in our life? I mean, some people call it, you're becoming enlightened. You're starting to feel more of yourself and you're starting to see things from a different perspective how do you know when you're entering into that enlightenment i guess you know it because you see things as they really are so you drop all perspectives perspective perspectives are actually filters mm -hmm. that do not allow you to see the truth mm -hmm. it protects us exactly uh, well uh, protects us but actually it's it's uh, when you have perspectives then and you cannot see the truth then it can be quite dangerous because you you are easily misled mm -hmm. and uh, when you awake you begin to to drop all those perspectives coming from um, family from religion from philosophy from uh, science from uh, the, the damaging narratives from the system and then you you see reality for what it is just like it happened to me i began to see that that in my family there were a lot of toxic dynamics i thought that they were normal but they were toxic you know <laughs> and i thought well, we oh. think that all families are like that i mean how do we know yeah and you grow up like that so you think it's normal but when you i when you awake, you you see that it's not normal at all, on the contrary. And then you begin to see that, for example, um, talking about the system, the narrative, when I was suffering from eating disorders, for example, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, there was the image uh, in the commercials of the ideal woman that was blonde, thin, and tall, you know? That was propaganda. <laughs> and, I mean... It, you thought that it was normal, no, because it was, we were bombarded with that. And when you wake up, you see that it is not normal at all. It's a manipulation to make you behave in certain ways, to make you buy certain things, to make you do certain choices that you really don't need to. Mm -hmm. And it is dangerous because it fuels such a such a commercial or a narrative. It fuels the your worst behaviors. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. and a lot of people start not feeling bad about themselves because they're not measuring up to what they're watching on television mm -hmm. all of the time or now the internet. And so it takes women a long time to get over that if they ever do. And uh, so that, and I mean, it's not just for women, it's for men too. I mean, mm -hmm. we're seeing beautiful, gorgeous men and we have, you know, I think our unconscious mind makes us believe that they're all together. They're happy. Like those people are the ones who've truly made it. They're happy, <laughs> but that's not necessarily the case, but we buy into something. We buy into a fairy tale all the time. It right. is true what you say. Yeah, yeah, and absolutely. And when we're not living what we feel is our fairy tale, we feel that we're not measuring up. We haven't really made it, you know. Once you get married and have children, then that's when I'm going to be really happy. But what you find is when that happens, your life actually gets really difficult for a long, long time when you're raising children. And so, I mean, you're giving a lot of perspective to me as well and the audience about these things, because these are the types of things that we don't think about. We live our lives and we don't sort of live at the depths that you've learned from, because, you know, I, I really commend you that you have risen above not such a great uh, situation, not once, but twice, and then took your journey inward. And I really feel that there's a whole, and, and it's been said, there's a whole shift in human consciousness where we want to step into the true essence of who we are. But in doing that, there's a lot of pain because we need to reflect 
back to things that weren't so good in our life and heal from that so that we can be free enough to help other people and hold our hands out to help those other people on their journey. And so I really love that you've brought this to our attention. And uh, so at this point, I'd like to ask you, do you feel that you've been called or crafted your journey? I was called, definitely. Yeah, I, I think I was predisposed as a child already. Um, and uh, because I was interested in, in behavior, for example, and someone uh, also said to me, have you, ever, have you uh, ever noticed that you as a child were different than us? Uh, well, here in my village where I grew up, I really didn't notice that at the time. But then I reflected on it and they said, just look at the picture of us together and look at us and you, how we are, we were different. Mm -hmm. And, but then, you know, I got lost when I began to, to manifest the toxicity of my family. And when I began my journey uh, of personal evolution, then things began to become clear and in 2008, yeah, I, it happened. I mean, it was fantastic and amazing experience. I woke up at 2 p.m. No, it was 2 a.m. Sorry, at 2 a.m. And I felt as if something was pushing me downstairs to sit down behind the computer. And I did that. I followed that. And mm -hmm. I, sat, I sat behind the computer and... I wrote for five hours consecutive. And I wrote the draft of what today the new human being is. Beautiful. And then at seven o'clock, I stood up and went to bed again. <laughs> and I, then when I woke up, I thought, what was that? <laughs> yeah, I love that. That wow. has happened to me. I absolutely love that. So you definitely were called. I just love it. You're listening to Courting Your Soul with Rhonda Grant, whose podcast has been treated with digital audio health by my sponsor, Symatrax. And today we have the great pleasure to talk with Ilana Perella. Ilana, can you let the audience know how they may reach out to you? And if your book is now published, how they may purchase that book? That yes, uh, you can find me uh, on my website the new human being dot cloud you can send me an email info at the new human being dot cloud and you can find me on social medias especially instagram linkedin but i'm also on facebook and tiktok my book is not published yet so it will be uh, probably this this year well that's wonderful what extraordinary discovery have you found in your life a new way of being and living free from harmful influences and that will help us preserve our fundamental humanity. And I would like to say that more than a discovery, uh, it was something that I uncovered. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Because the concept of the new human being is an old concept mm -hmm. that was never implemented before. And I am doing it for the first time in our history. Beautiful. Thank well, you. I'm looking forward to reading your book. And so do you feel that being called in the morning at two o'clock to go to your computer and write, do you feel that you channeled, there was a channel going on that you were getting information and just typing it? Someone I spoke to, said that to me you were downloaded they they yes. said so i cannot say more than that yeah. yes yes that's right yeah that's what i wondered mm -hmm. it's been such a pleasure to have you on this show is there anything that i haven't asked you that you'd like to talk about before we wrap up the show no actually we kind of talked about the the yeah the essentials <laughs> Yes, that's right. Of my mission. Yeah. 
of your mission. Yes. Well, thank you so much for being on the show. It's been wonderful meeting you and uh, I wish you the best of luck when you publish your book. Thank it you. Like it was it's, a... going to, it's going to be amazing. It will be. Yes. And it was a real pleasure to be your guest. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for listening. Theme song for Courting Your Soul is Sun on the Water, composed and performed by John Park Wheeler.